And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Hello and welcome to Highland Country Fellowship. Wasn't that beautiful worship? Uh, I, uh, I know the, the team does not like to be singled out. And they want that worship to go to God, and I think it did. I think it just did there. So, uh, If we've not yet met, my name is Bill Rector. I'm delighted to be the teaching pastor here at Highland Country Fellowship, and I've met some of you that are visiting us for the very first time, and I'll, I'll try not to scare you off, uh, although it, it, sometimes it doesn't work. We always hope that whether you're here for the first time or you've been coming for uh, all two years, we've been around, uh, that you experience three things. And the first is this just wonderful, welcoming fellowship of people. And, and I, I can tell you, whatever I've been through during the week, whatever I've been through on the drive to get here, these, these people with the Spirit of God living inside of them just uh, brighten me up. And I hope you experience that. And I hope you experience it every week. Uh, I also uh, hope that you experienced genuine worship that you participated in. Uh, and, and I hope you continue to do that. It's a worship service, so we do it collectively, but it's also something that you do individually. And, and these gifted people draw us just a little bit closer to the throne room of God. I hope you experience that and continue to. And the third thing we hope you experience is, is what it's my privilege to do. And we go, we go verse by verse through God's word. See, God's word is living and active. And when I chunk it out on you, it kind of changes you whether I do a good job of it or not. That's how powerful it is. Well, I'm going to try and do a good job anyway, okay? So let's, uh, let's open God's Word. Let's see what it has to say for us today. Uh, I'm in the Gospel of Luke, and I'm going to get a running start here. Let me go to verse 46 here. There we go. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he'd said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. Now there was a man named Joseph, a member of the council, a good and upright man, who had not consented to their decision and action. He came from the Judean town of Arimathea, and he was waiting for the kingdom of God. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and he took it down, wrapped it in a linen cloth, and placed it in a tomb cut in the rock, one in which no one had been laid. And this, beloved, is the word of the Lord, and the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. There are... Things that uh, are highlighted in these scriptures that we're going to look at. And it's, it's really interesting. Last week we took a look, a look at the last words of Jesus. That, and however awful a scene it is to think of our Lord dying, it still is, it, it, it's a sense of accomplishment. As he says, it is finished from the cross, paid in full. And then when he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, um, it, it means so much, especially when you've recently experienced the loss of a loved one, to know that that's really the destiny of us all, that, that each of us will have to, our spirit will have to be committed somewhere, uh, and, and to follow the way of Jesus and to commit our spirit into the hands of a loving father uh, is, is, is perhaps the most beautiful thing that any of us can do, and Jesus led the way at that. Uh, and, and there are people that witness that. That happened around 3 p.m., we think, on Good Friday. Uh, the ninth hour, the Bible tells us. Uh, you know, I wonder what it would have felt like to have been one of Jesus' disciples. I, I really do. They've been following him for three years. <sighs> they're, they're in shock. I mean, uh, just less than a week ago, he's triumphantly riding into Jerusalem. And... They're, they think he's going to be king. They have the most noble hopes that he can revive their nation. And they have the most noble hopes that he can draw people back to more genuine worship of God. You know, just as a timeout, I can relate to that. Can you? 
wanting to revitalize our nation, wanting to draw people back to a genuine worship of God. That's, that's, that's a noble thing. I, I can see myself just like them and then all of a sudden stunned that the person that I thought was going to do that didn't just leave, but he's hanging on a cross, meaning he's cursed of God. I, I just, it's hard to imagine how let down they would have been. But not everything was a letdown. We're going to hear a little bit about that group of people, his disciples. But Luke's going to tell us in these passages about some people that had a different response. And I think this is important. The gospel is a beautiful, wonderful, true tale that can change your life. But if you listen to it and you don't respond, you're probably actually worse off. God's living voice comes through this gospel and he beckons you to respond to it. And Luke, in this section, is going to tell us about the response of three individuals. And I, I'd like to point them out to you. Actually, one, two individuals and one group of people. The first is the centurion, verse 44. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. Um, many of you know centurion, the word centuries in there. This, this is a person that commands 100 Roman soldiers. That's how he gets the title of centurion. Um, he would not have had that rank. This is kind of like a non-commissioned officer. This is, would have been one of the highest ranks you could have in the Roman army without being an officer. Okay, so this is like a master sergeant or a master chief, and it's someone who at that time would not have gotten to that rank. He would have been older and very experienced. Okay, um, I think it's fair to say that he would have seen many campaigns and probably seen hundreds of people die. I think it's also fair to, see that, to say that he brought about the death of a few people on his own. Okay, so this is, this is a person who it's hard to know what they're thinking. It's hard to know all the evil they've seen and the evil they've caused, and they've probably become very hardened to it all. He was put in charge, and I think this tells you something of a crucifixion death squad. And this man saw Jesus die. And he'd seen hundreds of people die. He'd probably crucified dozens of people. Seeing what had happened in verse 47, he said, surely this was a righteous man. It's really interesting. The word he chooses for righteous has a double meaning. Um, and, you know, I have to be careful of that because sometimes I'll call, you know, like this shirt is righteous, right? You know? Um, I, I, you know, I... And, by that, I do not mean it has attained any right standing with God. Although this one might, because Kyle has one just like it. And... But there's a dual meaning. Uh, righteous usually means right standing with God. But it also, in this case, means innocent. The police sometimes use that when they say this was a, a righteous arrest, meaning they did it the right way, they had the probable cause, they had the warrant, they read the victim their rights, or they read the perp their rights, or whatever, Vic, victim perp. Huh? Meaning it was innocent. So this is a dual meaning. He's saying Jesus has right standing with God and Jesus is innocent all in this one word. And I think both things are true. Amen? Amen. But he didn't just say that. <laughs> he didn't just say surely he was a righteous man. It, it, it says he praised God and said that. And I want you to think about this. He's just nailed a man to the cross and watched him die. Isn't that an odd time to praise God? Think of our own usage of that. You know, if, if, if uh, I heard that a neighbor was in a car crash, I wouldn't go, oh, praise God. Now, if I heard a neighbor was in a car crash and walked away without a scratch, I might say, oh, praise God. Right? This makes sense. This doesn't. Why? Well, because something good. God protected my neighbor over here. Over here, why would I praise God? Why is he praising God? Do you ever wonder that? It, it just it kind of surprises me. Um, and I think he's praising God because it's the first time he realizes such a being exists. His, this is a discovery of God as much as it is a praise because he's finally seen. You know, after all the things he's been through, he's finally seen there really. It, it probably had beaten out of him a long time ago the idea that there was a benevolent God or that there was any good left in the universe. And after seeing what happened to Jesus... 
all of a sudden he believes. Luke doesn't put it this way, but Matthew and Mark say that in addition to this, he said, surely this man was the son of God. This is the, his response to seeing what Jesus did on the cross is to believe in a God that he doubted before. Amen? You know, I don't know if you've ever watched somebody go through something so tough. I, I have a couple of times. And their attitude is so positive. And I just wonder. And I, it teaches me. There's some strength that they're tapping into that I don't have. Amen? Do you know what I'm talking about? When I was younger, I saw this a lot in my mother. Recently, I saw it in Donna's mother. My mother-in-law, who is now with Jesus. And, and I always wanted to know, what, how, how are you able to do this? And, and 1 Peter 3.15 is this verse that tells us, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. Forgiving people while they're nailing you to a cross, not yelling out, not crying out, crying out in a loud voice, Father, forgive them. It is finished into your hands. I, that convinced this man that there was indeed a God. And, and you could do that too, just by the way you occasionally face up to a miserable circumstance. I don't want to wish a miserable circumstance upon you. Amen? But if one happens to you, do you realize you have an opportunity to witness to those around you as to how the strength of the Lord you rely on that gets you through it might be so powerful more valuable than any words that could be said that might cause someone to ask you, do you have some peace that I need to know about? And he's, yeah, I do. Amen? Amen? So as we study how these people responded, this centurion praised God. He, he recognized God exists. Now, if we're mature believers... Probably for us, this, this might not be so much that we discover that there is a God, because I, I don't think anybody in this room would be here on Sunday morning if they doubted that. Maybe we want to investigate. Maybe we want to know more. Maybe we're seeking this God. But maybe for us, it's more of recognizing that God is actually in something that I didn't think he was. That God is acting, maybe through a tragedy or through a difficulty or through an encounter with a neighbor. God is acting in some event that is... Oh, my gosh, God's in this, right? It seems silly, but when we recognize that, then we realize that whether the outcome is good or bad, whether my neighbor is, is fine or not, that God is still in it. Amen? Listen to the words of Job. Job chapter 1. A oh, whole bunch of rotten stuff has happened to Job. I mean, it, everything's been wiped out instantly, as fast as it could. We, Job doesn't know why. We do, because we can see what's going on behind the scenes. Job chapter 1, verse 20. At this, Job got up, tore his robe, shaved his head, then he fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Now, the older version of that verse is the one that many of you will remember. Right? The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away, blessed be the name of the Lord. Either way, because the Lord is in it. Amen? Amen. The Lord may be in it to bring about a good through your suffering. Would you sign up for that? I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I'm not a mature believer. I'm a naughty little boy. But if that happens, maybe, maybe the centurion awakening is all of a sudden I see God's in it. And I hope that's, that's similar to you. So I have a little chart that I'm going to build over the time of these three respondents. And the, the first is the response of the centurion was to recognize, can we, is that one up there? There we go. Is to recognize and praise God. And we're going to put all three of them up there so you can contrast them. Because there's another reaction that we're going to talk about in verse 48. When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. Right? And this is the Jewish crowd that had gathered. All the people. Now, uh, Luke, by using the term all, suggests that it was those that were sympathetic to Jesus and those that were calling out for his crucifixion. 
we knew that there's a mixture of both there. But Luke says all of them did this. Witnessing Jesus' death caused a reaction equivalent to the beating of the breast is equivalent to mourning and repentance and repentance. Uh, it's an, it's, in some ways, it's, it's sorrow, but in other ways, it's sorrow as a recognition of something that I've done wrong. If you want to know the best definition of what beating one's breast would have meant in that culture, Jesus tells us in a parable. I love it when Jesus does all the work for me. In Luke 18, verse 10, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. Okay, The Pharisee is someone who's built his reputation on looking righteous. A tax collector is the scum of the earth. Okay, there, Some say they still are, but I'm not going to say that because I want to be on good relations with the uh, Department of Revenue. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. By the way, some believe that that's translated prayed to himself. So the Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. Fasting twice a week and giving a tenth, those aren't bad things to do. I've never tried fasting twice a week. I, I fast for a few hours overnight, and that's about it. It hasn't become a spiritual experience for me. Okay, enough. Come on. Let's go. The tax collector, though, he stood up at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus concludes the parable by saying, I tell you the the truth, this man, meaning the tax collector, rather than the other, meaning the Pharisee, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. Amen? So you want to know what beating your breast means? God have mercy on me, a sinner. That's what the crowd did. They were repentant. They saw what had happened and they were like, oh my gosh, what have we done? And I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but repentance precedes forgiveness. Always. See, I, I, I'm, I'm really not trying to make anyone feel guilty here. But you can't trust Jesus as your Savior unless you've gotten pushed down to such a rotten position that you realize you need to be saved. That's how we end up with bumper stickers that says, God is my co-pilot. See, because I don't need a Savior. I just need an advisor, a consultant now and then. No, I need a Savior. Right? And and it's so the first part of salvation is recognizing you need it. Right? And that's, that's the thing. I'm, I don't want people weeping and gnashing or shaving their heads or feeling guilty. I'm not a travel agent. I'm not trying to send anybody on a guilt trip. But, but listen to what Luke says. Luke chapter 3. When John the Baptist, the, the predecessor, the forerunner of Jesus was going out, he went into all the country around the Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Right? I hope that makes sense. If you, if you don't know you're lost, you can't be found. If you don't stop and ask for directions, right, you, you assume you know where you're going and you drive around for a while. The first miraculous act that God may do in your life is probably performed by the Holy Spirit. And it's a conviction. It's a conviction that you are a naughty little boy. You used to think that you were pretty good, and now all of a sudden this this is almost like a work of God in your life. Jesus describes it this way through the gospel writer John in John 16, verse 7. But I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the counselor, that's the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will fill us all with wonderful things and make us all rich. No. No. When he comes, he'll convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. Isn't that awful? But but it's so important. If we don't know that we have the disease, then we're not interested when someone offers us the cure. 
the very first work of God in our life, the miraculous intervention of the Holy Spirit to save you is to convict you of your sin, to point out that you don't have right standing with God, and sometimes even to point out that we're all kind of under God's judgment were it not for Jesus. Amen? And let me tell you how important this is to salvation. The Lord himself says people who have recognized this about them are blessed. Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount, beginning in verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for right standing with God, for they will be filled. And it doesn't mean God wants us to be meek and miserable all the time, but you, you can't look up until you kind of are pushed down. Amen? You don't see the stars until it's dark. And this is part of the very first part of salvation. That happened to a whole mass of Jewish people because of the events of the cross. They were miserable because they realized they'd done something wrong. But God was preparing them. Less, about seven weeks later at Pentecost, Peter then comes along, tells them, yeah, you did this, but... Listen, Peter's speech to them, Pentecost, uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 36. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you've crucified, both Lord and Christ. You did something wrong. When the people heard this, verse 37, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? You get it? Conviction precedes forgiveness. But sincere conviction always brings about forgiveness. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, and all whom the Lord our God will call. This is not just, there's not one way to save Jewish people and another way to save. This is God's plan, and it always has for all people, and it was revealed on that day. And 3,000 of them, 3,000 of them became Christians at that moment and re- because they had been convicted and repented. Amen? And, you know, for me, this is real personal to me. Maybe you can tell because this is what the Holy Spirit did on my life. Oh, I can tell, I remember the moment. Some people say they, they describe the moment of their salvation as elation. Oh, for me, it was just utter, utter humiliation. And it was about time, my wife will tell you. <laughs> so we have the centurion who, witnessing the death on the cross, recognized and praised God. We have the people who, witnessing the death on the cross, recognized their own sin and repented of it. Now Luke's going to tell us about another group, another person. But before that, he kind of, in verse 49, he tees up something that we'll probably get into next week. He said, but all those who knew him, including the women who were following him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. These are all the remaining disciples. Luke had a way when he was talking about the 12 named disciples, he'd say the 12. Of course, now he'd have to say the 11, because Judas is gone. Right? But when he just used the term disciples, he was really talking about a larger group of people. And and we know this because he he even says, um, including the women who had followed him from Galilee. And that's, he's going to mention those women twice, here and then again in verse 55. They play a critical role in Jesus' burial and a critical role in his resurrection as well. Okay? So he's telling us about them. And I think what Luke is doing is he's kind of starting at the cross and making almost like concentric ripples that go out like a pebble in a pond. There's the centurion, there's the Jewish people, there's the disciples that stood at a distance, right? And now the next person, a little farther away, but certainly someone moved by this, Joseph of Arimathea. Now there was a man named Joseph, a member of the council, a good and upright man who had not consented to their decision and action. He came from the Judean town of Arimathea, and he was waiting for the kingdom of God. All four gospel writers mention Joseph of Arimathea. Matthew includes the fact that in addition to being a member of the council, that he was rich. 
And that's, uh, had he been one of the Sadducees, a member of the council, there was a lot of wealthy Sadducees. So that's very possible. All of them set him apart from the million other people that must have meant, been named Joseph at the time by saying he was Joseph of Arimathea. And that's interesting, except it's a little bit of a mystery. We know it's a Judean town, but we don't know exactly where Arimathea was. Don't know. Uh, um, Josephus writes of people from the town of Rama. Uh, Rama is about just a few miles north of Jerusalem. It's where the prophet Samuel was born. And he calls them Ramathians. So one of the best guesses I've got is that he was Joseph, a Ramathian, and this became Joseph of Arimathea. Uh, uh, That's as good as any other. But the truth is it doesn't matter where he's from. It really doesn't. It matters that they used that moniker to make sure we knew which Joseph we were talking about. It doesn't matter where he's from because he lives in Jerusalem now. He's a member of the council, and he has a tomb we're going to find out later. You wouldn't have a tomb in a town that you weren't living in. So we know he's a member of the council. We know he didn't consent to this, and this is actually kind of good news for me because as you can read the Gospels, especially John's Gospel, you can get the impression that all of the Jewish people and all of the Jewish leaders were against Jesus, that they were blinded by it, and then some of them, were their eyes were opened at Pentecost. It's kind of nice to know that, no, no, there was kind of a mixture. Like everything else, there's a continuum. Some of the chief priests, the elders, the leaders didn't agree to this and consent to him. Annas and Caiaphas, they were crooked as a dog's hind leg. They'd corrupted the temple system, and a lot of the chief priests went with them. A whole bunch of people had gotten into works-based systems to try and look righteous. And it was, it was a fraud, and God knew it. But there were some people that were different. There were some people who were different, and it's good to know that Joseph was one of them, right? We, we hear that he was a good and upright man, that he was waiting for the kingdom of God. Uh, that's nice to know. It's really interesting. There were descriptions of people similarly at Jesus' birth and now at Jesus' death. Let me just take you back for a minute. Uh, John the Baptist's parents, Zechariah and Elizabeth, the Bible described them in Luke 1. At the time of Herod, the king of Judah, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. So we got some good-hearted people in love with some good time and men. <laughs> Sorry, I had a little too much Willie and Whalen. Uh, not enough Bible in there. Another good-hearted person is Simeon, right? Simeon is there when, they, when at Jesus' birth, they bring Jesus to the temple. Uh, Simeon, uh, in, in Luke chapter 2, verse 25, now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he'd seen the Lord's Christ. You, you get it? At Jesus' birth, there were some people that had this special anointing of the Holy Spirit of God. And at his death, there is also a guy named Joseph of Arimathea. Now, what was Joseph's response, right? We saw the response of the centurion. We saw the response of the people. They're really important. What was Joseph's response? Well, going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, verse 52. (laughs) You know, Luke, Luke condenses stuff a lot of the time. He really does. He takes a full two-hour movie and puts it into two verses here, 52 and 53. And, and I, you know, I, I can't do that. I pry that can open, and we've got we to gotta talk about some of these things. Uh, but do, for Joseph to go to Pilate and ask for Jesus' bo- body, that took guts. He's outing himself as a disciple. John calls him a, a secret disciple later. So he is... He's not going to be accepted anymore in the Jewish community. And and again, that doesn't mean as much to us in our age. You know, you get kicked out of a barbecue restaurant, you can just come to another church, right? It's an inside joke. We're the only church in Texas history to get kicked out of a barbecue restaurant. And I repent of it, I do, I really do. I do miss the smell of that place because... It shortened the sermons when I could, no, there's some burnt offerings out there. We need to. (laughs) 
And now Sammy's accused me of just running right on. And I said, well, cook something. <laughs> and where were we? <laughs> Joseph, Joseph, he, 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 for you and I, we, we, we get kicked out of the first Baptist church. We go to the second Baptist church. It's not a big deal, right? In, in, the, Jewish, in the Jewish culture, you, you couldn't transact with people. And you'd have to move. Not only would you have to move, you'd have to move far enough away that no one ever heard of you. So for Joseph of Arimathea, he's done. He's not a member of the council anymore once they find this out. He can't transact. He's going to have to pick up and move. He, this is, he's risking some terrible things. He's also risking some terrible things by going to Pilate. Because Pontius Pilate had had just about enough of Jewish council people to come into him that day. They snookered him into, into crucifying an innocent man, and he knew it. And, he, and they snookered him into letting go a guilty man, and he knew it. I think you're taking your life, and your hand's just setting foot in his place. But Joseph of Arimathea did. In uh, Mark's gospel, Mark tells us uh, in verse 43, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate to ask for Jesus' body. Boldly. Right? Verse 44, Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that was so, he gave the body to Joseph. There's a lot in there. We may talk about some of those things next week as we get into some of the burial rites. But I think it's a fair question to ask, why did Pilate let him have the body? I mean, I can assure you that the chief priests, the people that were trying to discredit Jesus wanted his body hanging there as long as possible so that everyone who might have believed in him before would see him up there and go, that can't be of God. So uh, maybe, maybe Pilate did it just as one last victory he could claim. I honestly believe that he had some sympathy towards Jesus. I think he knew Jesus was innocent. And I think when someone came and requested the body, he let take it, let him have it. And that's what I'm saying. <laughs> There's a, so a two-hour mini-series here that Luke condenses down to two verses. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen cloth, and placed it in a tomb, cut in the rock, one in which no one had yet been laid. There's a lot there. We'll, we'll talk about that, some of that next week as we talk about the Galilean women and how they assisted in the burial. But I really want to bring this to a close because I wanted to show you these three responses that we've got now. We've got the centurion who saw Jesus die, and recognized there was a God and gave him praise. we got the people that saw Jesus die, and they recognized their own sin, and they repented. And we got Joseph of Arimathea, who saw Jesus die and was prompted to action despite whatever personal risk it would be on himself. Those are three responses that Luke tells us about. And you know, like I said, the Gospels are a beautiful tale. And like the song says, I love to tell the story. But this is living words of God that require a response. And it's, so it's fair for me to ask here, what's, what was your response when you first were moved by the Holy Spirit? I've told you a little bit about mine. I've had all three of these experiences in my walk as a Christian, but my first was, God have mercy on me, a sinner. I, I, I'll just I'll tell you... Um, You have to respond. Please, there's some response to Jesus. It, it's, it's better. It would have been better off if you'd not come today than to hear this message and not respond. And I don't say that out of any arrogance. I say that out of the authority of God's word. In Second Peter and in Hebrews, it mentions that. So what's your response? How did you respond? How will you respond? knowing what you know about the death of Jesus. Maybe, maybe you'll be like the centurion. Maybe some of you have been seeking and wondering and doubting whether there is a God. Maybe God will come through these pages and show you that this is not the book written by men. There is a divine personality in here that longs to speak you and loves you. Maybe you can give God praise for something rotten going on in your life that you never thought he was in before. Maybe your response will be like the people of Israel. Uh, like mine was, where you, you, you'll recognize 
your sin. You know, uh, God doesn't always tell us all of our sins at once because I think it would crush us. So over time in my walk, he's revealed them to me, and it's never pleasant, right? But it's that conviction that there's something I need to work on. There's something that's hindering my walk. And once I admit it, and I sincerely repent, right? Uh, uh, W.C. Fields said the key to sales was sincerity. And once you can fake that, you've got it made. <laughs> right? I love that line. But you can't fake sincerity with God. The sincerely repentant are guaranteed forgiveness. Amen? Amen. But it, <laughs> you can't fake that sincerity. Once, once the sin, I'm not, like I said, I don't want anybody to feel guilty. But if, if guilt requires that you repent, then be forgiven and trade your guilt for grace. Amen? Now, maybe like Joseph of Arimathea, and this is big for me. Maybe there's some action that you're being prompted to. Maybe right now, there's a, you know, I'm going to give that person a call. Or I'm going to arrange to visit that person, right? There's somebody I need to witness to. There's an action, right? Words are great, but actions speak louder than words. Maybe there's something that you can't let go anymore. Maybe there's an injustice that you've seen. In, and you know what? I, I, an, an abuse, some wrong, and Satan's counting on your not acting. And maybe God's prompting you. No, no, this is where you, righteous, upright people, stand up and say, no, I don't know. Maybe it's not quite that noble. I don't know. It may expose you. You may be taking some risk. You may out yourself as a Christ follower. It may make you unclean. You realize that handling Jesus' body made Joseph of Arimathea, and later we're going to learn Nicodemus. It made them unclean. They couldn't celebrate the Passover. You may have to get your hands dirty. I don't know. I really don't know how you're being prompted. That's the good thing about it. Is it's you that are being prompted by God. And, and I don't want anybody to feel guilty about it. But I do want to tell you something. Just based on some experience. <laughs> if God is prompting you to do something, do it. You won't have peace until you do. It's like a Jonah story, right? So if, if you're feeling that prompting, I'd love to know about it. I'd love to know how you respond. And, and so please, if you feel so inclined, please tell me. Or please, you know, and, and, and remember, the Gospels are a wonderful story. But they're the living words of an active God. And he beckons us to respond. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we acknowledge yours is a living story. <laughs> uh, we read, we hear your words. It's lovely, it's beautiful, but there are ideas that change our lives, that change our soul and prompt us to respond. So Lord, please make your will clear to us that we may obey you. Help us sift through our own emotions and be fixed upon your will for our, our response. Prompt us as your obedient servants. We, we long to obey you, Lord, not out of fear or not out of guilt but in response to the absolute depth of the Father's love that we've seen. We praise that and the glorious name of Jesus Christ that allows us to come to you. Amen.